Come, Nerevar. Come. Today we will be going over the secondary protagonists of the Elder Scrolls series. These Enwas usually get in the way of the hero and prevent him from achieving his full potential. They might appear in some games and not others, but without further ado, let us begin with these Enwas. Arena has one of the most confusing plots. The Elder Scrolls Arena graced us with the pixelated mess that is the mongrel Emperor Uriel Septim and his lackey Talon Warhaft. They get trapped in oblivion, exposed to hours of waking nightmares, while the Enwa Jaeger Tharn is domineering over the Septim Empire. This Talon guy apparently has this elaborate backstory, but the most essential thing that you should know about him, Nerevar, is that he is the master of the Eternal Champion, so the Eternal Champion has been listening to some mongrel dog of the Empire propaganda before he was chosen to be a hero. Therefore, even if the Eternal Champion is a Dunmer, he has been brainwashed to the point of no return. Ah, Daggerfall, the second game in this whole mess of pixels. Well, Nerevar, this one is a little bit more complicated, but technically due to the warp of the West, this game has several secondary protagonists. It all depended on which Enwa you decided to give the Totem of Tiber Septum to. When the hero gave the Totem to the Emperor, the Mantella allowed him to use the Numidium to bring peace to the Iliac Bay once and for all. Basically, this is the mongrel dog ending. When the hero gave the totem to the Underking, he used the power of his creation to free himself from undeath after centuries of restlessness, leaving the Numidium dormant forever. I call it the underdog or the undermongrel dog ending. When the hero gave the totem to Manamarco, the King of Worms used the artifact to deify himself, leaving the plain of Mundus and rendering the Numidium dormant. I call this the false god ending. When the hero gave Gortwog the totem, he used the Numidium to earn Orsinium Imperial recognition by destroying Daggerfall, Wayrest, and Sentinel. I call it the Boethia's dropping ending. When the hero gave the totem to the leaders of Daggerfall, Wayrest, or Sentinel, each of those kingdoms respectively gained sole eminence in the bay before breaking away from the Empire. I call this the Bretonois ending. When the hero kept the totem before journeying into the crux, the Mantella killed the hero outright and activated the Numidium, which began rampantly destroying Tamriel until the combined might of the Empire finally destroyed it. This is the selfish ending. That is buggerfall for you. Too many characters to keep up with. Moving on briefly to Battlespire, the secondary protagonist is Old Man Chimer, a Breton Enwa who has contacts with Molag Baal. Khmer was born on Cecily Island, a small provincial territory off the coast of Northmore High Rock. At some point in his long life he became a retainer for the Dureni clan, an aristocratic dynasty of Altmer and Breton merchants who ruled over the Isle of Balfiera. In his most ambitious scheme, he attempted to trick the Daedra Lord Mehrunes Dagon into making a pact that would ensure he lived forever, quote, in his hometown among the happy voices of his friends and countrymen, end quote. Then, using the Savior's hide to reflect Dagon's attacks while absorbing the Daedra Lord's power through an incantation of his protonymic or in farm tool terms, true name. In his final moments, the Prince of Destruction cursed the mage, twisting the words of their deal into a nightmarish reality, plunging the Isle of Kisili into oblivion, killing its inhabitants, and trapping the conjurer there, where he would never die, but continuously age. Some time later, after many failed attempts, Mehrunes Dagon successfully invaded the battle spire during the Imperial Simulacrum. This was when Chimeri encountered an apprentice battle mage who had entered the realm following Dagon's retreating forces. He then assisted the young hero, offering crucial information needed to escape the realm, such as his knowledge of the Spear of Bitter Mercy, and ultimately defeat the Daedric Lord once and for all. The next batch of secondary protagonists we are going to discuss is from that linear Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard game where you play as Cyrus. However, three characters come to mind when it comes to the secondary protagonists of the game. One of them is Tobias, Cyrus's Nord Enwa and mongrel dog of the Empire friend. Tobias is an old friend of Cyrus and the former captain of their mercenary crew who is temporarily staying in Stros Mackay at the Dragon Tail Inn. Cyrus received a letter from Tobias, which led him to the island in search of his sister. After he and Cyrus parted ways, he became a merchant, 
and this occupation eventually brought him to Stros Mackay. Knowing Izara was a loyal crown, he feared for her safety and asked about her whereabouts at the temple. There, Brother Nidal told him she was missing. While on the island, Tobias became well acquainted with Drikius, the Dragon Tail's barkeep, who smuggled the letter out of Stros Mackay for him. Izara is the sister of Cyrus who went missing three months before his arrival on Stros Mackay. She was married to Hawkan many years ago until Cyrus killed him. Cyrus learns about her disappearance from Tobias in a letter he sent through Sarathra. Prior to completing the quest Rescue Izara, you can ask nearly anyone about her whereabouts. Nagasta confirms that she is alive, as he did not sense her fall into his soul snare. She is a member of the Restless League and had a lodge at their hideout, where she wrote in a blood-sealed journal. Izara was tired of waiting for the League to act and decided to steal Prince Ator's soul gem and head to Stros Mackay. There she searched for Voa's ring with Brother Kithril and sought the help of the Mages' Guild in order to use the soul gem on Ator's body. One of the Mages, Johto, tried to help her, but he could not. However, Johto knew Nagasta had such knowledge. Johto warned Izara that she needed the flask of Lilandril to defend against Nagasta's magic, should he turn hostile. Together, they found a piece of the map to locate the flask, but Izara grew impatient and went ahead without it to negotiate with the necromancer. Nagasta offered to free the prince in return for her soul, an offer she accepted out of desperation. Nagasta, in turn, delivered the soul to Clavicus Vile. Izara's soulless body still resides at the top of Nagasta's tower. After you kill Nagasta and win back Izara's soul from Vile, she decides to return to the Restless League immediately. Cyrus tells them what Nagasta said. The soul gem was the amulet delivered to Lord Richton and is now guarded by Nafala Largus in the palace treasure vaults. Izara gives you the key to the treasure vaults. She was Prince Ator's secret lover, and the treasure vaults were going to be her jewelry chambers. Izara appears in the final cutscene inside the palace. She has ordered the rebuilding of the old quarter, and tells Cyrus that Baron Volag and Tiber Septim are coming to Stros Mackay to sign a peace treaty. Basil is the leader of the Restless League, and can be found in their hideout. He is on the side opposite from where Yaeli's boat docks, standing next to Vander, his right-hand man. Your confrontation with him does not go well initially, although you learn that Izara is not at the hideout. Vander will attack you at the end of the conversation. Once you defeat him, Basil will give you a bandage to heal your wounds and the key to Izara's lodge. He hopes that Cyrus will be able to open Izara's journal somehow. Once you finish reading the journal, a cutscene will play. Basil recounts the Battle of Stros Mackay, in which Prince Ator died, but further reveals that Archmage Voa managed to put Ator's soul into a soul gem to preserve his life. Without explaining how, he says the Restless League obtained the soul gem and was working on a plan to bring back the prince. Then Izara stole the gem and Basil is clueless as to where she went. After rescuing Izara from Nagasta, she will head back immediately to the League hideout and Cyrus follows her. Basil refuses to send his men to Stros Mackay until the prince is restored. He is not confident that Cyrus will manage this task, and believes the League's raids and piracy will eventually force the Empire out of Stros Mackay. When you are ready to restore the prince, Basil will show up at the Temple of Arche with his men, and they watch as Sabin performs the ritual. Seeing that the plan has failed and Ator's soul is now in his sword rather than his body, Basil starts to leave, but Cyrus makes a powerful speech that changes his mind. Cyrus orders him to attack the harbor in an effort to empty the palace, allowing Cyrus to enter and kill Lord Richton. Finally, we are done with these Enwas from the pixelated low-resolution graphics games that frankly do not honor the Sixth House and the tribe unmourned. It is finally time to move on to the secondary protagonists of The Elder Scrolls III, Morrowind, the game that truly honors the Sixth House and the Tribe Unmourned. If you want to do the same thing, please subscribe to my sermons, raise your thumbs and write on the parchment down below. So, in Morrowind obviously I, the Sharmat, am the secondary protagonist. We conquer Morrowind together and drive the mongrel dogs of the Empire out of Morrowind and depose the false gods of the tribunal. 
Or that is what could have been if it was not for the meddling of the two secondary protagonists of the game. The first one I would like to mention is everyone's favorite skooma addict, mongrel dog of the Empire, Caius Cassades. Caius Cassades is an Imperial monk and Grand Spymaster of the Blades in Vardenfell. He resides at his home in Balmora, with an admitted skooma problem. Though he appears to be just an old man with a fondness for drink and narcotics, regular patrons of the South Wall Corner Club have noticed that he holds his skooma better than even a Khajiit would. It has also been observed that people who judged him only on his appearance, quote, aren't with us anymore, end quote. During the final conversation with him, he mentions his superiors being concerned about his sugar. Nevertheless, there is an impressive amount of skooma, moon sugar, and paraphernalia in his house, and on his person. He wears cheap common pants with matching shoes and a belt. He also carries five samples of moon sugar. As Grand Spymaster of the Blades, Caius Cosades is the most senior person in Vardenfell in this organization and will allow fellow members to use his bed for sleeping. But honestly, Nerevar, who wants to sleep in a skooma addict's bed linens? Just imagine sleeping on his bed while his house is covered with skooma smoke. After giving you the quest, Mera Milo and the Lost Prophecies, Caius is recalled to the Imperial City and permanently disappears from the game. What a disgusting piece of work. The other two secondary protagonists are less important. One of them is Daivaith Fear, the Telvani wizard who is one of the most ancient beings on Nern. Seriously, Nerevar, he is 4,000 years old. I mean, I am also that old, but I think he is older than even myself. He cures you from corpus, Nerevar. That corpus was my gift to you, and he removes the negative side effects, making my gift only half as useful. He also has clones of himself that he, in my opinion, mistreats in ways that are not even describable. The other one is Vivek, the false god of the tribunal that betrayed your predecessor here on Red Mountain. He is vain and vindictive. You might call me a narcissist, Nerevar, but trust me, Vivek is far worse. Vivek, or Vaik, warrior poet deity of the Dunmer and V in the Almsivi, was the guardian god-king of the holy land of Vardenfell, and ever-vigilant protector from the so-called dark gods of the Red Mountain, the Gate to Hell. He is also called the Master of Morrowind. Though some aspects of his past are blurred by time and questions surround some of his more controversial choices, Vivek has always represented the spirit and duality of the Dunmer people which is reflected in his half-Dunmer, half-Kymer appearance. The warrior poet spent his long life creating numerous works and wonders. He was a prolific writer, perhaps most notably with the 36 Lessons, a series of cryptic texts widely open to an incredible amount of speculation and conjecture, primarily to act as a guide for the prophesied Nereverine. Numerous artifacts were associated with the God King, including his legendary spear Muatra. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, he mostly resided at the pinnacle of his palace in the city to which he lent his own name, Vivek. Hundreds of pilgrims and tourists visited his holy city daily. He guided and protected the Dunmer until his loss of divinity and subsequent disappearance near the end of the Third Era, a sacrifice he not only accepted but helped to bring about. The tribunal temple would collapse in his absence. The new temple refers to him as Saint Vivek and declared him a member of the False Tribunal. Everyone is blaming the Dunmer named Sul for the Red Year, but I believe Vivek is mostly responsible for the Red Year. Even with his false god powers, he could have thrown Bar Dao elsewhere, but no, just to show how merciful he is, he decided to keep that thing floating over the city. What a grand and intoxicating innocence. Moving on to the Elder Scrolls. 4. Oblivion. Calling that Breton Enwa Joffrey a secondary protagonist is an insult. He is worse than Mankar Cameron for keeping the Amulet of Kings locked in a wooden box. For that reason, we will talk about the most important secondary protagonist, if not THE protagonist of the main quest of Oblivion, the mongrel dog of the Empire, Martin Septim. Martin Septim was the illegitimate son of Uriel Septim VII and a mysterious mother. Martin was spirited away as an infant by Joffrey, the Grand Master of the Blades. Martin grew up knowing nothing of this and spent some time getting acquainted with the false gods of Oblivion. After realizing this is a terrible idea, he became a priest of Akatosh in the city of Kavach. That was where he found himself, 
Imagine being so close as to realize the ineptitude of the Daedra and choosing to live for the false gods of Nern rather than the true god, me. Is this how he honors the Sixth House and the tribe unmourned? His father and half-brothers were assassinated by the mythic Dawn, leaving him as the unwitting sole heir to the ruby throne at the onset of the Oblivion Crisis. Blade's agents were able to find Martin and keep him safe until the end of the crisis. When the uncrowned Emperor of Tamriel was forced to sacrifice himself to stop Mehrun's Dagon. Truly, this Enwa saved Tamriel from being overrun by one of the most ridiculous Daedric princes. I do not like Mongol Dogs of the Empire, but I have to give credit to Martin for stopping one false god by using another false god. The Knights of the Nine technically has a secondary protagonist, and no, it's not the Prophet. I believe the spirit of Pelennol Whitestrake is the secondary protagonist of that DLC. It is said that Pelennol emerged into Nern like a Padamaic, carried by Sithis and all other forces of change. Described by Morahaus as an Etada, or spirit, Pelennol plays the same role as a long line of avatars sent by Shazar to champion the cause of mankind and stop the elves from destroying them. Pelennol, however, is an exception, as he exhibits significant bonds to Akatosh as well, as he had the Amulet of Kings in his chest in place of a heart. Though it should be noted that it is said the gem was made from a drop of blood that fell from Lorcan's heart. He helps the hero of Kavach finish the job by defeating Umaril's spirit. The Shivering Isles also has two secondary protagonists. One of them is the old Sheogorath. Yes, Nerevar, I said the old Sheogorath. He used to be Jigalag, the Daedric Prince of Order, with his armies of order. However, all of the other Daedric Princes feared and became jealous of his power, so they cursed him into becoming the Mad God. However, the other false gods were not powerful enough to make it permanent, which allows Jigalag to return in his true form at the end of every era and reconquer his lands an event known as the Grey March. After that, however, he would be transformed back into Sheogorath, and Sheogorath would spread madness upon his lands once more. During one of the Grey Marches, the hero of Kvach mantled Sheogorath, therefore separating the two entities. However, the old Sheogorath, while he was alive, was trying his best to prevent the Grey March, and was sending the hero of Kvach on various quests. The other secondary protagonist is, of course, Haskell. Haskell is the Chamberlain of Lord Sheogorath, the one constant in the ever-changing whims of the Mad God. He often takes on the appearance of an elderly man in a melancholy yet flamboyant suit. Just like his colleague Dias, former Chamberlain of Jigalag, his exact origins are unknown, but he claimed to have once been a mortal who mantled Sheogorath, becoming a vestige. On another occasion, however, he has claimed to have been under the service of Sheogorath since the beginning. He took care of all of the more administrative and mundane duties involved in running the Shivering Isles. Despite having once been mortal, he has no desire to visit Tamriel. He has a strong dislike of Mehrun's Dagon, and finds mortals to be irritating. In the Third Era, 433, Haskell helped Sheogorath's champion, the hero of Kvach, in his many endeavors, and eventually helped him stop the Grey March and free Jigalgorath of his curse. Haskell serves the champion as the new Mad God, and has been known to substitute the new Sheogorath when summoned to Mundus. He also takes care of the Shivering Isles when Sheogorath goes on vacations, and according to Sheogorath, gets in mind-boggling trouble while his master is away. Now moving on to Skyrim, which probably has two of the worst secondary protagonists in Elder Scrolls franchise history, the Enwa's Delphine and Esbern. Never have I seen such tomfoolery as I have seen from these Enwa's. Delphine and Esbern are leading the nearly defunct organization of the Blades, and they want you to kill the only other secondary protagonist of the game, Parthenax. I do not have love for the farm tool dragon Parthenax, but I believe he is a lot more useful than the likes of Delphine and Esbern. They are as useless as Joffrey, so I will not be wasting my breath on them any further. Parthenax, a legendary dragon whose name means Ambition Overlord Cruelty in the dragon tongue, is the leader of the Greybeards, who resides at the top of the throat of the world. His younger dragon brothers refer to him as the Old One. He was once the Lieutenant of Alduin, but rebelled against him and with the help of Kine, 
taught humanity how to use the thum. He has since lived out a peaceful life, constantly struggling against the primal need to conquer and dominate and teaching the Greybeards under Jürgen Windcaller's philosophy of the Way of the Voice. When Alduin reappeared in 4th Era 201, he aided the last Dragonborn in defeating him. In the aftermath, Parthenax sought to teach the dragons now scattered across Tamriel the truth and rightness of the Way of the Voice. Interestingly, Parthenax is missing the tip of his right horn. When it comes to Dawnguard, who do you think is the secondary protagonist? Isran can claim to be a secondary protagonist as much as he wants, but he is just a quest-giving background character. The main secondary protagonist of Dawnguard is Serana. I've got this one, Lord Dagoth. I am the daughter of Harkon and Valerika, sealed away with an Elder Scroll for centuries by my mother, so that my father won't find me. Unfortunately, we cannot choose our parents. My father wanted to find me to fulfill a stupid prophecy called the Tyranny of the Sun. He wants to block out the sun so that the vampires can thrive. However, even if the sun is just a hole in the Aetherius, blocking it out will have dire consequences for Nern. I teamed up with the Dragonborn and we beat my father. Good riddance. Oh, and well, as for the Dragonborn DLC, the secondary protagonist, sort of, is Hermias Mora. We have discussed him in detail on multiple occasions. He is the nerdiest Daedric Prince, that is just a whole bunch of tentacles. The realm of Apocrypha is full of seekers and other critters that make my skin crawl. Do you think I am being hypocritical, Nereva? Hermaeus Mora likes playing games and he watches as the first Dragonborn and the last Dragonborn fight each other. Well, Nerevar, thank you for listening to this sermon. Please don't forget to honor the Sixth House and the tribe unmourned by raising your thumbs, subscribing to my sermons, and writing on the parchment down below. I want to thank my patrons. Connor Runda, Tanya Davis, Unoriginal Username, Janelle Rambo, and Silky Johnson.